Her Gargoyle and the Seven Orphans is book four in the Gargoyle Shifters of New York City series. Published by Harley Romance Publishing, 2023. Chapter 1. Gabriel. Our new apartment was incredible. Expensive, dark and a little too edgy for my taste, but the security features were second to none. Bulletproof glass, 10-inch thick reinforced internal walls, and a panic room that would make any prepper cream in their pants. My brothers were happy, their beloveds were set on redecorating the whole place, and our head of security, Bill, was already updating the security cameras and adding passcodes for each bedroom door. It was insane how secure life had become which was great for everyone who now craved security. Everyone with a beloved. For me, the whole setup felt more like a jail than anything else. You ready? Roman called out, flicking his head toward the living area that faced the direction the sun would soon rise over the horizon. Yeah, coming. I sighed, getting to my feet to trudge out to the new area we designated for our daytime sleeps. To be honest, I missed the fresh air. I stepped onto my stone circle, ready for the sunrise, and the moment I'd turn into a stone gargoyle once more. Ever since Rose had discovered that we could actually move our shifting places from the roof of the New York Public Library to our apartment with its supercharged security, everything had changed. We'd moved our four stone circles into the new location, and we spent every day there. Most nights, too. Or my brothers did, anyway. Now that they had all found their beloveds, None of them wanted to spend their nights clubbing and bedding women. That was an activity I had to pursue on my own, which held little appeal these days. Rafe grunted at me. If you miss the air, then go out tonight. Don't stay in with us. I, for one, don't miss the panic of waiting for the next attack on top of the library. Rafe knelt down into position and I heaved another sigh. You're right. And in a way, he was. I was definitely calmer now, not fearing the moments we were in stone form and helpless against an attack if someone tried to destroy us. My skin tingled as the sun rose, the early morning light stretching across the city like the fingers of God. My wings turned to stone, my feet shifted to claws, and I was pulled down into a crouched position that shrunk my frame into a size that fit with my gargoyle. Our bodies were frozen, but our minds were not. I watched as my brother's wives walked over to their respective partner's statues, kissing them and talking to them softly before retreating to their beds for sleep. I tried not to feel anything. Not the jealousy that threatened to roar through my heart, nor the loneliness that came with being the only one of my brothers that hadn't found his beloved. Would I ever meet her? I was beginning to doubt it. And with that thought, the loneliness settled over me like a miasma. I was determined that no one would know of my feelings. I was frozen and would stay that way until the sun set in the west once more. And when we shifted back to our human form, I would pretend that I was happy being the only brother without a faded mate. Until then, I stared ahead, trying not to miss the view of the city I'd had when we'd lived our daytime hours atop the New York library. The moment my stone body melted away, I jumped off my circle and marched straight to my room for a shower. The new apartment's en-suites were massive and far too luxurious for a single person. I intended to pick up tonight and bring them home, let them enjoy the claw-footed freestanding bath and the huge shower. I'd been wanting to try that out for sex. I showered and changed into black slacks and a soft blue shirt. Then it was dinner time. When I walked back out to the lounge area, I expected to have the place to myself, like I normally did now that my brothers had their beloveds, but everyone was sitting around on the couches, enjoying a cocktail or a drink. You guys haven't gone straight to bed? I asked, mixing myself a drink with the whiskey they'd left on the counter. That's unusual. Roman, who was the nearest to me on the couch, looked up with a grin. Just relaxing for a moment, brother. We need our energy for the bedroom, after all. Come and sit. Let me share the good news with you, too. I picked up my tumbler and walked around the couch to face my oldest brother. Good news. The news of our relocation success has spread, and our Canadian brethren are planning to move tonight. That's great news. I took a sip of my drink. It was certainly something to celebrate. 
Too many of our gargoyle cousins had been destroyed by the so far nameless enemy that seemed intent on killing every single one of us. What do the elders think? The room went quiet, and I glanced from one brother to the next. I couldn't help the amused smile that lifted my lips. Yeah, didn't think they would be so happy about it. They didn't like it when we moved our stone circles here, did they? The elders were sticklers for tradition. They preferred to keep things the way they'd always been done. Roman sat up straighter, pulling Chrissy in closer. They will have to deal with it for the moment. Until the danger is gone, we have no other choice. Resting here during the day is so much safer than where we were before. I still think we should move. Nate said, grabbing his beloved and kissing her hair. Texas, Australia. I don't care where. I laughed at his suggestion, then realized he was serious when his gaze settled on me. You must be joking, I managed to sputter out. We can't leave New York. Nate's eyebrows flicked up. Why not? I opened my mouth to reply, but nothing came out. The only argument I had was the fact that we'd always been here, and we should stay. Not a particularly compelling speech. In fact, it made me sound more like the elders than I liked. Nate crossed his arms over his chest. Well, I lifted my chin, annoyance at my brother making me bite at his tone. We've always lived here. Why should we be driven from our home? Nate made a P-S-S-H-H-H sound. Rose and I are thinking of leaving. Her stepmother, as well as half of the city, are still looking for her. I blinked at my brother. No way. He really was serious. How long would you go for? Rose stood up and walked into the kitchen area, pulling some snacks out of the cupboard. For the women, I assumed. We couldn't eat anything but the freshest, rarest meat. A few months maybe, she answered instead of Nate. Once I turn 25, I can come back, inherit my father's fortune, then get the lawyers I trust to handle the rest. Anthony, Rose's security guard, stepped forward. The media were here again, Rose. They've been tracking me also and have caught glimpses of you. Now would definitely be the time to move to one of your country estates. If we leave, we're not going anywhere that Natasha could find her, Nate said. We have money and property. We'll find somewhere safe to hide for a few months, and it won't be one of Rose's family properties. I glanced around the room at my brothers. What about the rest of you? Do you all want to leave? Rafe reached for his drink. Gabe, none of us actually want to leave. New York is our home. But after a lifetime of believing that we'd never be able to leave New York, I wouldn't mind going away for a few months. It'd be fun to travel a bit. Bella curled into Rafe's side. I'll go anywhere with you. The library can get along without me, especially if it is only for a few months. Only a few months. I muttered as I shook my head and walked into the kitchen. They were crazy. Leave New York? Never. Roman wandered into the kitchen and watched as I began to cook the steak I'd pulled out of the fridge. You heading out? he asked. I nodded, clenching my teeth against the wave of loneliness rolling over me. It was no one's fault that I was the only one without a beloved. Yes, of course I am. Chrissy and I will stay, Roman confided, speaking softly as the rest of the group continued to chatter about where they'd go if they decided to move. We don't have any wish to leave New York, though it would make sense for Nate and Rose to get away for a while. My steak sizzled for a moment on the hot pan before I slid it off and onto my plate. I sat down with my knife and fork, ready to eat. Yeah, I suppose it does. And after what Rafe had endured during one of the attacks, it made sense that he might want to get away too. I ate my meal, my brain a whirl with all the possibilities. I'd never thought we'd leave New York, and I certainly never thought that we'd split up. If Roman stayed here with his beloved and me, would the other two really leave us? Oh, look at this place. Bella gasped, showing her phone to Rose. The girls giggled and chatted about all the places they wanted to go while I forced my stake down. I didn't want to leave, and I certainly wasn't going to stay around the apartment all night listening to these six get it on. As couples, of course. My brothers wouldn't be sharing their beloveds. Ever. 
I put my plate in the dishwasher and washed my hands. Okay. I'm off. I grabbed my cell and my wallet and headed to the door. Chaos. Nate called. I reached for the front door. Yeah, I guess. Best place to pick up some women. Anthony walked over to me and thrust out a large black card with silver embossed writing on the front. It looked more like an invitation than a business card, and when I looked closer, I realized it was an invitation. Anthony said, there's a fundraiser tonight for city housing. Best party around. If you wanted an alternative to chaos. I reached out and took the card, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I shivered at the strange sensation and forced a smile to my lips. Thanks. I headed out the door, past the normal security and over to the elevator. While I waited for the car to respond to my call and ascend to the penthouse, I stared down at the invitation. Everything inside of me was telling me I had to go. But why? What would I have to gain from going to some stuffy dinner where the rich threw money at the poor, just to make themselves look good? My goal tonight was a willing woman in my bed, not a peacock parade full of old widows. My mind made up, I headed downstairs, through the foyer and out onto the street. I turned right, ready to walk the few blocks over to chaos. I'd be early, but that was fine. I'd take up my usual spot and have a few drinks before the main groups arrived. But for a reason I could not explain, my feet would not take me to my destination. To my usual den of debauchery. I tried again, mentally trying to force my legs to move, to take me down the street and away from our apartment building. But I could not go. No matter how hard I tried. Eventually I laughed and said aloud, fine then. I'll go to this damn peacock party. I put my hand up and called over a cab, grateful that I'd worn my best pants and newest shirt. Chaos be damned. I had a charity fundraiser to attend. Chapter 2 Angelique I had seven foster children at home, and instead of being with them, like I should have been, I was on my way to a charity event my boss had organized. You okay back there? My Uber driver asked as I grunted and groaned, struggling to hike up my spanks beneath my too tight black dress. Yeah. Fine. I blew hair out of my face. I'd let Jenny, my 16-year-old foster daughter, do my makeup. She'd actually done a great job, if you viewed me in a mirror. But I was sweating and hated the feeling of such heavy-duty foundation. Seriously felt like face paint. The driver pulled up a block from the event address. Here you go. I stared out the window. We're still ages away. And I was wearing heels that were going to murder my feet. I can't get any closer. There are limos for miles. I grabbed my bag and opened the door. Thanks for nothing. The driver pulled away from the curb the moment my door was shut. I began the trek toward the large hotel, my feet already aching from the arched angle of my shoes. Fucking hell. I grabbed for the front of my dress, hiking it up with both hands as I balanced on my heels and simultaneously gripped my clutch handbag beneath one arm. I should never have let my 14-year-old, Talia, talk me into wearing this stupid dress. She knew how much I detested going out. And if I had to, I preferred to wear more comfortable and far less revealing clothing. The city was busier than normal, especially for a Tuesday night. My Uber driver had been correct. Limos lined the street, making it impossible to get closer except on foot. When I finally reached the hotel foyer, I was hot and I was sure I was sweating, though I couldn't know for sure unless I touched my face, and with makeup no doubt threatening to melt right off, that was the last thing I wanted to do at this point in time. I marched up to the security guard and pulled my invitation out of my bag, shoving it at him. Here you go. He took it without a smile and opened the door behind him. Have a good evening, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I muttered. My job tonight was to get as many donations as possible for our foster and adoption center, one of the few in the city that focused on older aged children. My boss Harris rushed over to me in his gray suit. Where have you been? Cool your jets boss, I said, taking a deep breath and blowing it out slowly. Breathe. Remember? 
I reached out to straighten his tie and he let me, though he did roll his eyes the same way my teenagers did. This is an important night, Ainge. I know, I said with another sigh, this one for me. I'm here. And I'm ready to work. Good. He tugged on his ill-fitting jacket. Because there's a lot of money here tonight, and we need to make sure that at least some of it is donated to us, and not just to the private homes. I nodded and turned to face the mass of people, dancing and drinking in the massive ballroom. The easiest way to get donations was to hold up photos of cute little babies and beg the old women to help. But what these rich cronies didn't know was that babies were the easiest to adopt out and often the easiest to find foster homes for. We dealt with children over the age of six, abandoned by their parents or taken by the state and sent to group homes. We weren't anyone's first choice for donations or for adoptions. But I loved my work and I loved my kids. Even if they drove me crazy sometimes, I wouldn't have it any other way. You know you've never explained to me how you can afford to look after seven kids. My boss whispered at me as we stood side by side staring out at the room. I chuckled. What do you mean? You pay me so well. It was his turn to laugh. No, seriously. How do you do it? Especially in this city. A waiter walked past holding a well-balanced tray of drinks. I stopped him with a discreet wave and took two champagnes, handing one to Harris. It's not a complicated answer. My parents were wealthy, but I lost them both to cancer by the time I was 25. Oh, I'm so sorry, came Harris' measured response. I shrugged. What can I say? It was a horrible time of my life, but I inherited their house, and enough money that when the adoption agencies look at my file, they don't hesitate. Not to mention the fact I had a live-in nanny, Sharon to help with errands and cooking, and the kids I applied to look after were the ones that no one else wanted. So you work because... I grinned at my boss, my very gay boss, which meant he wouldn't misconstrue anything when I said, because I love you too much to leave. He rolled his eyes again. I suppose having a job sets a good example for your kids. I nodded. Yes it does. And I get to meet the kids that need me early in the process. Children that were bounced from foster home to foster home were often damaged, abused even. As soon as I felt a connection to a child, I looked at adopting them immediately. So, are you going to stop at seven? Harris joked, obviously believing like everyone else that I should have stopped at two or three. I took a sip of my champagne. For the moment, I answered, though I was pretty sure I'd have no choice soon. There were always children and teens in need, and as long as that was the case, I didn't want to close my home to anyone else. I was already 38 and my youngest, Albie, was 7. I'd have kids in my house until I was at least 55, probably longer. But my six-bedroom house was currently full. My eldest Jenny had her own room, as did the live-in nanny. The other six each shared with one other. The system worked, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit I was tired. Harris clapped his hands. Okay, showtime. I swallowed the rest of my champagne and placed the glass down on a nearby bar table. Yes. Let's do it. The next hour or two passed quickly with me moving from group to group, handing out business cards and showing various couples photos of my kids. I didn't usually like to put my kids into the spotlight, but when it came to fundraising for our organization, I considered the personal touch worthwhile. When it was time for speeches, I excused myself from the high-brow couple I'd been speaking to and walked toward the exit. The bathroom was a quiet, cool space where I could finally take a deep breath and check myself. The mirror wasn't kind. Oh God! I used some paper towel to mock up the sweat and wipe away smudged mascara before combing my fingers through my hair. I was a mess. Just breathe, I told myself, ripping the sink with both hands and forcing air in and out of my lungs. You'll be finished here soon enough. My cell phone was in my bag and when I pulled it out, there were a dozen messages from my kids. I shook my head, laughing as I read them. There was nothing wrong, of course. They just didn't like their dinner or wanted more iPad time than the nanny allowed. They were good kids, all of them. 
Even with the rough start in life they'd been given, they were doing so well. I was insanely proud of every single one of them. I tucked my cell phone back into my bag. As I headed back out the door again, the hairs on the back of my neck tingled in the strangest way. I stopped and put my right hand on my left forearm, my whole body prickling with goosebumps. That's weird, I whispered. It wasn't cold. I had no reason to feel like someone had just walked over my grave. There wasn't anyone else around except for two security guards, so I slipped back into the ballroom and caught the end of Harris' speech. He wasn't the best salesman, but he was passionate about foster care, having survived the system himself. I snuck to a corner of the room where I could stand by myself, scanning the crowd for anyone else I might need to speak to. My gaze met a man across the room. He was standing with a group of young women, all fawning over him with bright smiles and touches to his shirt. As he lifted his chin and speared me with an intense stare, I tried to look away but couldn't. My gaze was stuck to him. His eyes flashed silver in the muted lighting and I gasped, finally managing to break the eye contact and shuffle sideways so I was no longer in his direct eye line. My heart was pounding and my flesh prickled with goosebumps once again, all over my body. I wasn't one for being superstitious, but I believed in my intuition. It had served me better than anything else in my life. And everything inside of me said that man was dangerous, for me. He had the power to change everything, and that was the last thing I wanted. It didn't make sense, of course. But it didn't have to. I had to get out of here. Now. I pulled out my cell phone and requested an Uber, assuming that the front of the hotel would be free of limousines by now. Once that was sorted, I kissed Harris goodbye and ran for the front entrance. I looked left and right, anxious about seeing that man again. Those eyes. I couldn't put my finger on what the problem was, but I needed to get away. I burst through a group of people mingling near the entrance and had made it all the way across the foyer before a hand grabbed hold of my wrist, stopping me in my race to exit. Excuse me. The male spoke politely, and I almost moaned aloud at the sound. His voice was like silk. Perfect in every way. I knew who it would be without even looking. I closed my eyes, not wanting to turn and see the man that I was trying to avoid. Let me go. I have to leave. Where are you going? He gently tugged on my wrist to turn me around. I wanted to pull against him, to fight my way out of there but I couldn't resist the tug of his voice and my own heart calling out to him. My gaze was lowered, focusing on his dark shoes. Finally, I dragged it up over his tapered waist and sky-blue shirt to his face. A face that surely couldn't belong to a mere mortal. He was absolutely glorious in every way. My knees trembled beneath me. I stumbled away, dislodging my arm from his grasp. I have to get home, I managed just before one of my heels snapped and I went tumbling. I cried out at the inevitable pain that was heading my way as I fell, only to be scooped up in the stranger's arms before I could hit the ground. Oh wow! I gasped, wrapping my arms around his neck. How had he moved so fast? I was no lightweight, not by anyone's stretch of the imagination. But he carried me down the stairs like I weighed nothing at all and instead of fighting to get down, I felt as safe and comfortable in his arms as I did in my favorite chair at home. I gaped at him, my mouth remaining open a few seconds too long as I stared up at his perfect face. Where are you taking me? My home. He pushed through the glass doors until he stood on the sidewalk. He didn't put me down. No, you can't take me to your place, I whispered, still embarrassingly clinging to his neck. Then I coughed to clear my throat. I have kids. I have to get home to them. The stranger's head turned sharply at my words and he stared down at me. Those eyes. Those beautiful, sexy eyes. You have children? He sounded shocked at the idea, and that seemed to break my trance. A little. I wriggled and he put me down on my feet. One heel was broken beyond repair, and I listed sideways before managing to remove both shoes. They dangled from my hands. My Uber will be here. I should go. No. Please. He snagged my arm again. 
Normally, I didn't like to be touched by strangers, and I certainly didn't put up with being grabbed by anybody. Why was I letting this man treat me like some sort of possession? I straightened my spine and put on my big girl's voice. Listen. I have seven kids at home waiting for me. I have to go. His eyes widened, just as most people's did when they discovered the size of my family. Did you just say? Yep. I nodded sharply, my stomach twisting with anxiety at the obvious sign that this guy was heading for the hills already, just like the rest of the men I'd met over time. Seven kids. I joke that we're like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Except two of them are already taller than me, and they go off to school each day, not the mines. The man in front of me quirked his head like he didn't know what I was talking about. My phone dinged and I dragged my head down to stare at the screen. Yep, my Uber's here. I waited for him to let go of my arm, but it didn't happen. Are you going to let me go? I asked finally. The Uber will only wait a few minutes. Can I please come home with you? The man's impassioned tone shocked me almost more than his words. To, to meet your family? I narrowed my eyes, unable to work out his motive. Do you foster children too? Surely this man had been invited to the event for his deep pockets, not his philanthropy. I'd like to learn more about you. Please. It was the second please that got me. My intuition was still screaming at me that this man was someone who would change everything. And yet, I wasn't getting dangerous vibes. I wasn't sure how I knew, but he wouldn't hurt me. So against all sane thought processes I finally sighed and said, okay, fine. But any weirdness and I'm calling the cops. Immediately. I have the local police captain on speed dial. That wasn't a bluff. With everything I dealt with at work, unfortunately, the police were often involved. Lead the way, the man said, finally letting go of my arm. I should have felt relieved to get some space from him, but instead my arm seemed cold when before it had been warm. I wanted to shove it back into his grip, so we could remain connected. What was wrong with me, all of a sudden? This way, I said, leading a complete stranger to an Uber that was about to be headed for my home. Chapter 3 Gabe I slid onto the back seat of the plain black car and held my breath as I tried to contain my excitement. I'd found my beloved. I couldn't believe it. She was the last woman I would have expected fate to have designed for me. I thought my mate, if I ever found her, would be similar to Chrissy or Bella, but the woman beside me was completely different from anyone I'd ever met in my life. She was older than all of my brother's mates, and she had seven children if she was to be believed. Add in the fact that she was deliciously curvaceous, and she would truly stand out amongst the women in my family. A sense of pride filled my chest at the thought. The car pulled out from the curb, and my beloved adjusted her seatbelt over her chest, making her breasts look even bigger than they had before. Damn she's hot. I cannot wait to get her beneath me in bed. I turned to face her, trying to distract myself from how beautiful she was, how desirable. My whole body throbbed with need for her. I wanted to tug her over to my side of the car and onto my lap and kiss the life out of her. Stop. I'm Gabriel. I apologize that I didn't introduce myself properly before. She glanced up at me, her cheeks flushed. I'm Angelique, though you can call me Ange. Angelique. I repeated the beautiful name, thinking about the word and the spelling. Wouldn't. Angel, be more appropriate. She blushed properly this time, her whole face turning a rosy pink that I could see in the dim light of the car thanks to my supernatural vision. No, she denied, her tone harsher than I expected. No one calls me that. Not since. She shrugged and didn't finish. All right, I hedged, wanting to immediately call her my angel, but since I didn't want her to throw me out of the car, I kept the words to myself. I'd watched her this evening, and her spirit was obvious. She was full of life, and I didn't doubt that she would call the police on me the moment I stepped out of line. She sighed heavily and rested her head back against the car seat. What a night. You didn't enjoy it. I asked softly, wanting to know everything about her all at once, 
but not wanting to startle her with too much intensity or weirdness. There was a lot for her to take in when I did finally tell her about who, or rather what, I was. It was work. She sounded as exhausted as ever I'd heard anyone before. Not that I mind, of course. I just hate all that pomp. I chuckled. Pomp? You mean the ridiculous clothes and designer brands, and people who believe they're superior to their neighbor? She lifted her head and stared at me. You? She cleared her throat with a rough cough. I assumed you'd been invited because you were someone who donated regularly. I grinned at her. No, I've never donated to that charity before. I was given an invitation by a friend. But I'm very happy to donate. Do you have a specific center or home that you wish me to write the check out to? She fumbled with her bag and pulled out a business card, handing it over with reluctance. I didn't mean to give you the hard sell here in the car. I shrugged. My brothers and I have all the money we need. I'd be pleased to donate to your cause. I didn't have my checkbook with me, but I pulled out my cell phone and sent off an email to Bill. Excuse me for a moment, I'll just let our manager know which charity to send the donation to. Bill would know what to do and who to send it to, so I simply typed in the details and pressed send. Thank you, Angelique said, her voice small in the space around us. You didn't need to do that. I shrugged. It's only money. It should be shared around to the right places. Don't you agree? Fuck yeah, I do, she said into the quiet, then slammed her hand over her mouth. Sorry. She mumbled against her hand. I have such a potty mouth. I couldn't help but laugh. You and my brother Nate would get along well. She dropped her hand and finally turned her body a little to face me. How many brothers do you have? Three, I answered, not getting into details yet. She smiled. I grew up as an only child, which is probably why I filled my parents' huge home with foster kids. Foster? Oh, so you don't have any blood, children. I shook my head with frustration. I couldn't remember the word, and I sounded stupid even to my ears. But Angelique didn't seem offended. Instead, she just grinned at me. Exactly. No biological children for me. My heart is full already. I could hear the satisfaction in her tone. The love. Those children, I began, then smiled and shook my head. I don't know anything about the foster system, I'm sorry. You're going to have to teach me. I'd never had anything to do with children, period. Gargoyles didn't procreate. The women I took to my bed were normally single, and being one-night stands, I wouldn't have known if they had children at home or not. I'd be happy to educate you some other time, she said, sliding to the edge of her seat as the car slowed down. But we're here. The car pulled over and Angelique got out. I followed her and was surprised to find myself standing in front of a large brownstone, not far from Central Park. Beautiful home. Thanks. She was already walking up the stairs. It was my parents' place. I inherited it ten years ago. So her parents must have passed away. I'm sorry to hear that, I said, not knowing how to empathize since I didn't have parents. But it must be nice for your children to live in such a beautiful area. Central Park is just a stroll away. We'd reached the front door and she turned to stare at me. You work that out quickly. I smiled at her. I know New York well. I've lived here my whole life. Me too. Angelique slid her key into the front door. I didn't want to tell her that I'd already lived five times longer than her, so I simply followed her into the beautiful foyer. She hesitated when she saw I had followed her in, but didn't kick me out. Instead, she locked the door behind me. Two girls with big eyes and long pajamas on ran down the stairs. Mom. You're back. How was that? They stopped when they saw me their sudden wide smiles hinting that it wasn't normal for Angelique to bring a man home. Girls, this is Gabriel. She waved at me and I smiled and nodded, not entirely sure how I should greet them. Gabriel, why don't you have a seat in the front room? I'll just go check on the kids and say good night. Take your time, I said, waving at the girls. They squealed and ran up the stairs once more. 
I walked into the front sitting room and glanced around at the family portraits and bookshelves lining the walls. On the mantelpiece was a Christmas photo, Angelique surrounded by children, all laughing and dressed in identical pajamas. I picked up the photo and stared down at a moment of pure happiness. That was last year. I turned to see Angelique standing in the doorway. She had changed into a pair of blue jeans and a black sweater. She looked just as beautiful and a lot more comfortable than earlier in the evening. It's the perfect family photo, I said, placing the frame back on the mantel. You all look very happy. She hummed, then laughed a little as she walked up next to me and pressed her fingertips to the glass. Albie was in one of his terrible moods and Jenny, well, she didn't even want to be in the picture. She thinks she's too old to be doing some silly family thing. I stared at her, once again hearing nothing but love in her voice. And yet, you got the perfect picture. She nodded. I love them and they know it. That love changes everything. She turned to look at me as she said those final words, and they echoed in the room like the gong of a church bell reaching far and wide, changing the air and the mood of both of us. I couldn't resist her a moment longer. I stepped forward and claimed her lips with mine in the next breath, unable to keep apart from her for another second. She was warm and soft in my arms, perfect in every way. I cupped her cheeks with my hands, holding her face as I encouraged her mouth to open and deepen the kiss, tasting her sweetness. She moaned and pressed her hands to my chest, gripping my shirt as though she were afraid that I was going to get away. I smiled against her lips as I lifted my head and said, I'm not going anywhere. She blinked up at me and the fog of passion began to lift. Oh, you can't stay. I don't have men in the house. Not that I really have men at all, but the kids. I can't. My body burned for her, and my shifter's need to claim his mate was riding me hard. Then would you come back to my place? I asked, feeling a shiver shoot through her. I only just met you, she whispered, biting her lip in a way that made me want to drag her to the floor and have my way with her. I know, but time doesn't matter. I cupped her face once more. Our connection will be forever. She frowned up at me this time. What are you talking about? I was losing her, I could feel it. This wasn't a woman easily seduced, even with our soul-binding mating bond. I stepped away, afraid to scare her and racking my brain to think of a way to keep her in my orbit. Will you meet me tomorrow night? How about during the day, she countered. I shook my head. I can't. But after sunset, I can meet you. Anytime. Anywhere. My heart pounded, panic setting in. I couldn't leave her here. What if something happened to her? Perhaps you would like to have a drink? Or a talk? I asked, not wanting to leave yet. It's barely midnight. If you're not too tired, we can do something with our clothes on. Angelique crossed her arms slowly and deliberately across her chest, making me smile. She was trying to be all strict and annoyed at me, and all I could think about was how delicious her breasts were going to taste when I had them in my mouth. We weren't going to do anything with our clothes off. She hissed the words at me, as though she was actually angry. I lifted my gaze to meet her eyes, and in her dark vision there were flames of annoyance I hadn't expected. Really? I asked, raising an eyebrow at her. Yes, he declared. I had to prove her wrong. Chapter 4 Angelique This guy was absolutely crazy if he thought I was going to do anything even remotely sexual while my kids were sleeping upstairs. I was their moral compass. Their safe space. Gabriel closed the distance between us and kissed me. I gasped against his lips, not wanting to respond, but his warmth seeped into me. His lips coaxed mine in the best way, his hands crept around my waist, his body pressed against mine. Everything about him was seductive and drew me in, whether I wanted him to or not. My lips opened against his probing tongue, and my arms uncrossed to let him closer. He groaned and moved his hand up to grip my face. I whimpered with longing and grabbed his shirt to pull him closer. I needed more. His hands went to my ass, grabbing me tight and pulling me against his hard body. Damn, I wanted him. So much. 
There was an emptiness inside me I'd never known before. I had to have him. Here. Now. Fuck the consequences. I tore at his shirt until the buttons popped and his skin warmed my palms. A shiver of absolute pleasure and something akin to, knowing, passed over me. I pulled back, something I wasn't sure I'd be able to do, I was too far down the hole. Somehow, I managed it. I stared up at him, my eyes barely open under the weight of my desire. He stared back at me, his eyes silver, like the frame around my kid's photo. Silver, that's just not possible. Is it? What are you? I whispered. Why do I feel like I know you? He lifted his hand and brushed my hair back off my face. Because you're my beloved. I blinked, my heart leaping at the declaration, though I wasn't even sure what it meant. You're what? He kissed my lips, softly this time, but the heat in my blood had cooled and I could think again. I pulled away gently, not wanting to offend him, but needing to know the truth. Please explain what you mean. Gabriel clenched his jaw, a muscle in his cheek ticking, then he nodded. Yes, all right. I moved away from him and sat down on one of my parents' good couches. I hadn't changed much in this room since they died, as I loved this space. The memory of my parents was strong here. My thighs trembled and my sex ached, but I lifted my chin and tried to ignore the ache of loss rushing through my core. Go on. He moved over to the mantelpiece, then turned around, his face serious. I'm not human, as you seem to have ascertained. I swallowed hard and forced myself to remain seated while adrenaline shot along my veins, making me want to jump up and run. What are you then? I'm a gargoyle shifter, he said with a completely straight face. During the day I'm a gargoyle, and at night I'm a man. I've been this way since I was made, over a hundred years ago. I couldn't help the snort that left my nose. A gargoyle? Sorry. I don't mean to laugh. But one of those grotesque stone statues that sits on top of buildings. He nodded, his face still serious. I kept waiting for him to crack up laughing and tell me he was joking, but he didn't. You can't be serious. He ran a hand through his dark hair, giving it a frazzled look. Unfortunately, the only way to prove I'm not lying is to show you. But that means you'll need to come to our apartment before sunrise. I narrowed my eyes. This isn't funny, you know. I've never brought a man home before, not even a friend. No one meets my kids unless they've gone through every police check there is, and for some reason I trusted you, went against my better judgment, but what you're saying sounds completely crazy. I pushed up to my feet, my heart pounding with anger. I was so stupid. Please leave. He took a step toward me. I'm not crazy. I'm telling the truth and you know I am. I do not. I gasped out. You're either crazy or a liar. What you're saying isn't possible. I was panting now, my breath rushing in and out. He took another step closer, a smile teasing the edges of his lips. I know you feel this connection that doesn't make sense to you. I know that you feel in your heart that I'm not a liar, even though your conscious brain is trying to tell you not to trust me. But that's not your instinct or what your gut is telling you. I crossed my arms over my heaving chest, trying not to think about how much his words made sense. I was angry and frustrated and confused, but part of me didn't actually think he was lying. Which made absolutely no sense. None. I don't know what to believe, I managed, beginning to shake from the stress of the moment. How could I possibly suspend my disbelief and believe in the impossible? This isn't. Gabriel reached out and gripped my arms, steadying me, giving me something to hold onto. I know this makes no sense to you, and I'm sorry I can't just drag you to bed and convince you that we're meant to be together. I nodded, because somehow I knew that in his arms I would forget all reason and just do anything to be close to him. Come to my apartment before sunrise. He squeezed my arms and then walked toward the door. You'll see I'm not lying, and you'll be able to meet my brother's women. They'll explain everything. What else is there to know? I asked, following his progress across the room. There are a few more things, he said with a smile. Immortality to start with. 
bad guys who are trying to destroy us, and my brother's desires to leave the city. Oh, I couldn't leave New York, I said with a shake of my head. My house, the kids, my whole life is centered here. Gabe grinned. I agree with you. I don't want to leave either. So, will I see you at 5 a.m.? I couldn't stop the shudder that passed through me at the idea of getting up that early. I'm not sure, I answered honestly. I wanted to, but whether I would actually go see his apartment. I wasn't sure. You'll need to send me your address. He walked over to the desk in the corner of the room, picked up a pen, and wrote on a piece of paper in front of him. Here's our address. My brothers and I all live together. Are they shifters too? I asked, smirking a little at saying the word. He turned silver eyes on me that stopped my smile in its tracks. Yes. They are. He stepped step toward the door. I want you to know that as my beloved, I will miss you for the next few hours. It will hurt for us to be apart. We're meant to be together now that we've finally met. Our hearts and souls are designed for one another. The poetic words coming from such a sexy man was a strange thing to hear. Almost incohesive, and yet it sounded like perfect sense. You're talking about soulmates, I managed to gulp out. A notion I'd never put much stock in. Until now. He nodded. Yes, and even though I know how much it's going to hurt, I'm afraid the separation might be necessary to prove to you how important we are to each other. My breath caught in my throat as my ribs squeezed tight. What do you mean? But I knew the answer. I was going to bed, alone, as I always did. And I could already feel a cold hollowness stretching out like the vastness of the ocean. See you at five. He strode to the door, opened it up, and closed the door quietly behind him as he left. I rushed after him, yanking the door open to call out, but he was gone. Vanished. What the? I moved onto the porch steps and looked up and down the street. How on earth did he manage that? I shook my head as I went back inside, firmly locking the door behind me. I leaned back against the door, my heart still racing. What the hell had just happened? Mom. Is he gone? The loud female voice floated down from upstairs. I groaned and took to the stairs, one hand on the balustrade in case my wobbly legs gave out from under me. I'm coming, Jenny. I hurried to my eldest daughter's room, opening the door to find her in bed where I'd left her, and the side table lamp casting a soft glow over the room. Can't sleep, sweetheart. I walked over and sat on my daughter's bed. Jenny was my eldest and the first child I'd ever fostered. She'd been nine at the time and had been an underfed, timid little girl with brown eyes. Her pain had broken my heart from the first time I'd seen her. She was glorious now. Healthy and strong, full of life. I wanted to stay up and find out what happened tonight. She grinned at me. I sighed and turned to face her properly. The event was overwhelming, too hot and stressful. As always. Jenny rolled her eyes in the dramatic way that only teenage girls had. No. I mean about the guy. I couldn't help but smile at her enthusiasm. Oh, you mean Gabriel? Yes. Do you like him? Is he still here? No, he just left, I said, narrowing my eyes at her. You know I don't have men here. I want to set a good example for you. Jenny smiled at me. We want you to be happy, not live like a nun. You make me happy, I said, reaching over and squeezing her hand. But that doesn't mean you have to be alone forever. Jenny said, showing wisdom and understanding beyond her years. I stood up and kissed her on the head. I'm going to bed and you need to sleep, sweetheart. You've got school tomorrow. I walked to the door and Jenny called out. See you at breakfast. I stopped. More than likely. I do have an early meeting, so if I'm not there for breakfast, I'll come home early and see you after school. Jenny nodded and slid down in her bed until her head was on the pillow, and she closed her eyes. She slept most nights with her light on, feeling safer that way. Good night, baby girl, I said, and closed the door behind me. I'd never lied about a meeting or work before, and I hated that I'd just done it. But what was I going to say? 
that I had this strange inclination to go and see if the guy I'd just met was full-on crazy or just halfway there. I went to bed and tried to get some sleep, getting only a few broken hours before I was pulling myself out of bed to call an Uber. You're crazy for doing this, I told myself, even as I was texting Sharon, my live-in nanny, to let her know I had to leave before breakfast. It was cold enough to make my nose tingle as I locked my front door and headed down to the Uber waiting for me. But I wasn't stopping. Gabriel had been right. My instincts told me that this man was special. That he and I were connected on a level that I couldn't explain away with logic. Did that mean that I thought he was really some sort of stone statue shifter thing? No, but the only way to rid myself of this strange obsession I already had with him was to recognize the truth about him. He had to be crazy. And when that was confirmed, I would be able to go on with my life without wondering what I'd missed out on. Chapter 5 Angelique I arrived at the expensive apartment block, told the concierge who I was, and they immediately showed me to the elevator and swiped a card that would allow me access to one of the penthouse apartments. I'd never seen a lobby with two discreet-looking security guards, but this one definitely had them. The doors closed, and the elevator rose straight up to the floor Gabriel had indicated. My stomach was tight and my hands clenched into fists at my sides, relax, relax, relax. The doors opened and there was a wall with a door in the center, and another two guards waiting. I gulped and stepped forward without getting out of the elevator car. Am I in the right place? An older man stepped forward so I could see him more clearly, and put his arm out so the elevator door wouldn't close. Angelique? I nodded. He smiled and kindness shone in his eyes. Yes. You're in the right place. Please come this way. He gestured to the large door and I followed him, the hairs on my arms prickling with unease at seeing the weapons the two guards were holding. Is there a problem in this building that so much security is needed? I asked the gentleman in a quiet tone. A lot of break-ins, perhaps? The man didn't answer my query. Instead, he opened the door and held it open for me. Ladies first. Normally I would have insisted he go first, but this was obviously a man of my father's era, and he was being polite, not sexist, so I hurried into the apartment at his request. My jaw dropped. Wow. What a view. The glass windows stretched from floor to ceiling, straight across the apartment, and showing the most incredible skyline I'd ever seen. Angelique. You came. I turned to the familiar voice. Gabriel was walking toward me from the kitchen area. I inhaled sharply, feeling the tug of desire deep within me once more. How did you sleep? he asked. I almost punched him in the arm for his teasing tone. Not well, but thanks for asking. I'd slept terribly, and although I wanted to blame the lateness of the hour or the wine I'd drunk, the truth was I'd missed Gabriel every minute, and my huge bed had felt cold and lonely without him. Which made no sense at all. I'd only just met the man. Come see the view. He took my hand and tugged me closer to the windows. And excuse the strangely dark furnishings. My sisters-in-law have replaced a lot of the decorations, but they are still to attack the kitchen, amongst other parts of the place. I hadn't really noticed the darkness before, not with that magnificent view taking my attention, but now that I looked around, I couldn't help but smile. He was right. So dark and brooding isn't your style? He shrugged. It's a little too dark in here. The bathrooms are positively gothic. I laughed at his pretend dramatics, but every time he spoke, the nerves in my stomach intensified. What were we to each other? What was this strange yet beautiful connection between us? Well, it's lovely, I managed. And the view is truly amazing. I stared out at the skyline, loving the lights and the parts of Central Park that were visible from this angle. My hand was still in Gabriel's, our fingers intertwined like we'd been this way forever. It felt so right. I stared down at where we touched, barely feeling it. Not that I couldn't feel his fingers. Of course I could. But being connected to him felt like the most natural thing in the world. Like we were one. 
So, I began, needing to push past this ridiculousness. When are you going to do your thing? He glanced at the clock on the wall. We have about 20 minutes. 15 before my brothers and their mates surface from their beds. Could I perhaps show you the rest of the apartment? My breath caught in my throat and nerves tangled my vocal cords. I couldn't speak, so I nodded. He kept hold of my hand and gently tugged me down a hallway. This home is huge. With four big bedrooms, all with personal ensuites. I gulped as I stared at the closed doors, then forced myself to say, Which is your room? He grinned at me with a carefree vibe that made my heart pound furiously. That grin. He would get away with a lot, using that grin. This way. He led me toward a closed door, then threw it open. I stared into a huge bedroom suite. Wow, this is enormous. My heart was still hammering in my chest, and my legs were a little wobbly as I walked forward. Entering his bedroom felt like I was sending a signal, and right now, I was happy to do so. I had to kiss him again. That brief moment we'd shared at my house tonight hadn't been enough. In fact, that sensual kiss had done nothing but whet the appetite of a starving woman. As soon as he stepped into the room, he shut the door and turned to me. But then he paused. He didn't reach out for me, and I could almost hear his thoughts. He wanted me to ask him to kiss me. He was waiting for permission. Suddenly, my courage evaporated. Gabe was staring at me, and I could barely stand it. I wanted him so badly, but it had been so long. I barely knew how to ask for such a thing. I turned away, breaking eye contact to stare around the room. Your uh, room is nice. And it was. The bed was huge, the colors dark and masculine. Silvers, blues and blacks. Gabe walked up behind me, sliding his hands around my waist and pressing against my ass. My eyes slid shut and I swallowed the moan that rose. Angelique, he whispered. My angel sent from heaven, please turn around and look at me. My dad was the only person who'd ever called me angel, and I'd always refused to let anyone else use the same term of endearment. But for the first time ever, on Gabe's lips, the nickname sounded right. I turned in his arms, sliding my hands up to his chest. Yes? I need to kiss you, will you let me? I reached for his head, twirling my fingers in the thick hair at the base of his neck. Yes? That one word was all he needed. He kissed me, hard and fast. I didn't freeze or balk at the show of intensity. In fact, I loved it. I kissed him back just as hard, just as passionately. I gripped his head and thrust my tongue between his lips. His hand slid over my body, squeezing my ass and lifting one of my legs to drape over his hip. I could feel his erection through his jeans, and I moaned at the promise of pleasure. Gabe's kisses began to slow and he shivered suddenly, before pulling back. What's wrong? I asked, gulping down the feeling of rejection. His smile was full of love when he cupped my face and kissed my lips once more, but this time the kiss was tender, not passionate. My skin is tingling. It's time. I need to go. I nodded, though I didn't understand. I wanted him to take me to bed and stay there with me forever. Gabriel led me back into the lounge area. I opened my mouth to ask him to kiss me again, when the sound of a door opening met my ears. A woman's laugh echoed through the apartment. Who's that? I asked instead, pulling my hand from Gabriel's as jealousy rose up and poured through me. Was he married? Had I been tricked? Who was that woman? A couple walked around the corner and into the lounge. The man was huge and handsome, the woman tiny, with a halo of red curls around her face. That's my brother Roman and his beloved Chrissy, Gabriel answered quietly. The jealousy that had burned only moments ago began to settle, and I shot him an apologetic smile. They'll all be out of their bedroom soon, he added. Oh yes. You did say you lived with your brothers. And he'd also said when I arrived that his brothers would be out of their bedrooms shortly. How had I forgotten that so quickly? A certain kiss seemed to have muddled my brain quite effectively. The couple had been engrossed in each other, but when I spoke they both turned to look at me. Chrissy's face lit up. Hello. 
She practically skipped over to me, grinning the whole way. I'm Chrissy. Are you Angelique? I nodded, not sure what Gabriel had told them. Chrissy covered her mouth and yawned. Sorry. I've been up with this one all night, and I cannot wait to go to bed. You've been in bed for the last three hours, Roman said, gliding up behind Chrissy, wrapping his arms around her waist and setting his lips to her neck. She giggled and leaned into his caress. Yeah, but I need some sleep. You are insatiable. Chrissy didn't blush, but I did. Not that she'd said anything wrong, but people usually didn't talk that way around me. I was spared further embarrassment when two other couples joined us. Gabriel made the introductions. Angelique, these are my other two brothers. Raphael and his beloved, Bella. And that's Nate and Rose. I stared at the woman Gabriel had called Rose. She looked familiar, somehow. Her hair was different, but I'd seen her face before. The answer settled into my mind, and I gasped. You're Rose Hilton. The big, gorgeous man at her side tugged her protectively into his body. Yes. She is. Her stepmother tried to kill her for her inheritance, and until she turns 25, we're keeping her hidden. My mouth dropped open, and I blinked a couple of times before I could speak. Rose, I am so sorry to hear that. Please don't worry about me. I would never tell anyone where you are. She smiled softly back at me. I know you too. You're Angelique Desmond, aren't you? The whole group stared at her, then at me. I threw up my hands in protest. Hey, I'm no high-profile heiress. Rose laughed. Well, not this year anyway. Ten years ago, you were in the papers most days. I was only a teenager, but even I remember that. I shrugged at everyone's inquisitive looks. Yeah, well, that was a long time ago. My parents were the rich high flyers. I wasn't made for the spotlight. Gabriel slid a possessive hand around my waist. No, you just adopted seven high-risk kids and gave them a home on Park Avenue. She's got children, Roman said, his voice deep with concern. Gabe, that could be a real problem. I twisted to glare at Roman. What are you talking about? My children were not a problem. Gabe kissed my hair. We'll talk about that tonight. My skin is tingling. The sun is coming up. He moved away from my side, as his brothers did from their respective partners. I stepped closer to Rose, not sure what was happening and feeling nervous. Rose linked her arm with mine, and we all stared out at the lightning sky, before Rose and I focused again on the men in front of us. How much did he tell you already? Rose whispered. I'm not sure, I answered truthfully. How much is there to know? Bella, the woman standing with Chrissy, laughed. Not lots. But you know they're about to turn into stone statues, right? I stared at her, then shivered all over. He said that's what would happen. But I mean, you know, it's a bit hard to believe. Right? Rose snorted out a laugh. Yeah, none of us believed it to begin with. That's normal. We've got vodka, gin, whiskey. What's your poison of choice? I stared at the woman who was offering me alcohol. You do know it's six in the morning? They all chorused with laughter this time, then Chrissy said, We're on gargoyle time now. It's pretty much midnight in our world. Then Rose added, And trust me when I say you're gonna need a drink after this. There's nothing like the first time you see it. The room was getting lighter by the minute, and as I turned from the girls to stare at Gabriel, he stepped up onto a large piece of stone, as did his brothers. My heart began to pound. Something momentous was about to happen. Gabriel lifted his gaze to stare at me for a moment, our eyes connecting and causing a cascade of emotions over my heart. Then he knelt down, dropped his head like he was swearing allegiance to a king, and right before my shocked eyes, he began to change. Gray stone wings sprouted seemingly from nowhere. Gabriel's feet became claws and he grew ears like a large bat. Then it was over, and the room was still. My gaze darted everywhere, all around the room. Gabriel and his brothers had simply disappeared. In their places knelt four different gargoyles. All grotesque, angry-looking monsters. 
I stumbled backwards until my legs hit the couch, then I collapsed onto the cushions. I can't believe it. I panted out the words, hyperventilating. Take some slow breaths, Rose said. I don't think we have any paper bags. Maybe breathe into your hands for a minute. I nodded, doing as she said and trying to slow my panic. This is normal for you. Rose sat down next to me and held my hands with hers. Don't talk. Breathe. In. Hold. Then out. I dragged air into my lungs, holding my breath for a couple of seconds, then slowly exhaling. Keep going, Chrissy said, setting a tumbler down on the coffee table and pouring a whiskey. You like it neat? Or do you prefer to mix it with Coke or something? I couldn't think clearly enough to answer her. I extended my arm and made a grabby sign with my hand. If this was medicine, I'd take it straight. Chrissy picked up the drink and handed it to me. I threw it back, gasping at the horrible burn and taste, but swallowing it down nonetheless. No wonder they'd offered me a drink earlier. They had known what was coming. Thanks, I managed to croak as I placed the glass back on the table. Then I blew out another long breath and finally began to feel human again. My brain was now semi-functioning. That was not what I expected. Chrissy poured another shot into the same glass, but I shook my head. I didn't need any more alcohol. The first one was still warming my insides. What were you expecting? She asked in a curious tone. To turn up and find out Gabe was insane? Pretty much. Then why'd you come? Rose asked, her lips twisting into a smirk. If you think someone's actually crazy, you don't turn up at their house at five in the morning. That's how you end up as a crime victim on the news. I flopped back against the couch cushions. You're right. I was stupid. But. I shrugged, unable to explain the compulsion that had brought me here. Though it seemed I didn't need to explain. Chrissy shook her head. You're infatuated. That's totally normal when you meet your mate. I rubbed my hand over my face. Oh God, don't you guys go on talking about that soulmate shit too. That's for kids and fairy tales. Okay, then explain why you're here, Rose demanded. I opened my mouth to respond, then snapped it shut again when I realized I didn't have an answer. Bella walked up to touch Chrissy on the arm. I'm going to bed for a few hours. I've got an afternoon shift. Bella nodded at me. Nice to meet you, Angelique. I got to my feet, my head fuzzy with shock and tiredness. It was all a lot to take in. I need to go too. I've got work as well. You okay to drive? Chrissy asked. I got an Uber here, so I'll do the same to get home, then off to work. Rose walked me to the door, and I indicated to the security guards who stood there with their automatic weapons strapped to their backs. Are these guys for your safety, Rose? She shook her head. No, well, I suppose they are. But it's for all of us, not just me. When I met Nate, the guys already had an incredible security force. How come? I asked. The polite man who'd greeted me when I first arrived took a step toward me. Allow me to escort you downstairs, Angelique. I will answer your questions as much as I'm able to. Thanks, Bill. Rose waved at me, then yawned. I'm going to bed. She turned and left, and I walked into the elevator car with the man Rose had called Bill. As soon as the door shut, he turned to face me. A few years ago, all the gargoyle shifters in the country started to be systematically eliminated. My mouth dropped open. Why would anyone do that? We don't know, Bill answered. The Mansevich brothers, Gabriel and the others, do not pose a threat to anyone. They do not harm humans, ever. Even before they met their beloveds. They drank too much and slept their way through every available New York woman in the last century, but there's been nothing in their behavior to explain why any group would want them killed. I blinked rapidly, hot tears forming in my eyes. Um, so they're safe now. Up there. Frozen in place. Unable to move. Oh. God. 
No wonder they had such high-level security. It must be terrifying for Gabe and his brothers to be frozen in stone and know that someone out there wanted to hurt or kill them. Should I leave? I said to Bill. Maybe I should stay. Would an extra set of eyes help? I wasn't much good with a gun. Bill shot an amused smile my way, and I had the urge to whack him. Way too many people this morning had looked at me in the same way. With pity. The brothers are safe here. We have the best staff around. The doors opened, and Bill indicated to another man standing in the foyer. He was wearing a suit almost as nice as Bill's, and from his watchful stance, it was clear he was also security. I'll introduce you to Anthony. We walked into the bright, clean foyer, and the man who looked to be in his mid-thirties came toward us. Good morning. I nodded at him, and Bill made the introductions. Anthony is Rose's personal guard, and Angelique is Gabe's beloved. Anthony's eyebrows flicked up. So, the set is complete then? I closed my eyes for a moment as a wave of fatigue passed over me, then I forced myself to speak again. Please don't announce that to the world, Bill. I still have to process what I just witnessed, as well as the whole concept of mates, or beloveds. I haven't decided what I'm going to do about it. Both men coughed over apparent laughter. I gave Anthony my most annoyed look. What are you laughing about? If I've learned anything this past month, it's that you don't have much choice over this beloved Link thing. Rose was besotted from the moment she set eyes on Nate, and from what the other women have said, it was the same with them. I groaned and rolled my eyes. Well, could you not shatter the illusion that I have some control over my life, please? Bill handed me a business card. This is my direct number. If anything happens or you need us, please call. I took the card, though I doubted I'd need it. Thanks. I'll see you. Later, I guess? Anthony nodded. I'm on day shift, and the guys return to their human form at sunset, in case that wasn't explained already. It wasn't, I said, already planning how I could get back here tonight with all the other things in my life I needed to juggle. So thanks again. I walked away before I gave myself another reason to stay. Chapter 6 Gabe I'd never spent my day dreaming about my beloved. Until now. Instead of sinking into the partial sleep that I usually did to while away the time in my gargoyle form, my mind raced with questions and worries about Angelique. What would we do about her seven children? What would she think when I told her that we all weren't safe? Would she choose to stay away from me until I could find a solution to our problem? I couldn't stand that idea, though it seemed the most likely. Once Rose turned 25, then the threat from her stepmother would disappear. There would be no point for the stepmother to try and kill Rose if the inheritance was no longer open for grabs. And once we finally caught the men behind our attacks, then we could continue our life stress and worry-free. Angelique would be able to join our family without any fears. But how long would that take? We still didn't know who was after us or why. It was impossible to fight an enemy you couldn't see. The apartment was quiet all day, the women not surfacing while the sun was up, except for Bella who headed out during the afternoon for her shift at work. Bill would walk around the apartment occasionally, making notes or taking a phone call. Other than the security guards shifting position, the place was incredibly peaceful. As the sun began to go down and darkness fell, the lights in the apartment flicked on and the sound of doors opening and women's chatter filled the room. My skin began to burn gently in that familiar way, then my body began to change. My wings shifted and floated down my back once more, no longer stone. My talons unfurled from the stone circle they clung to and my feet became human once more. I grew taller and opened my mouth to take in my first breath. The air was warm and heated. I grimaced. I miss fresh air. Rafe stepped off his stone circle and turned around to look at me. Yeah. I know what you mean. Nate stretched his arms above his head and groaned. So, when we know who's trying to kill us, we go back to sleeping on the roof. I was just stretching and wondering how long it would be before I could see and hold Angelique once more, when the sound of shattering glass hit my sensitive ears. 
What the hell was that? My brothers heard it too, and they all acted quickly, jumping across the room and grabbing their mates close to their chests. I can't see anything, Roman called, staring wildly around. Anthony. Bill. Bill rushed through the front door, turned around and locked it behind him. Three deadbolts and a combination lock. Secure the women, he yelled. We're under attack. Chrissy and Rose shrieked, then swallowed their screams under the command of my brothers. Rafe barked at his mate, who hadn't made a noise but was looking wide-eyed and terrified. Bella, take the girls and lock yourselves in the safe room. Take your phones. Bella, Chrissy and Rose ran from the room, through the door to Roman's room, where the entrance to the safe room was situated. My hands clenched into tight fists as Bill and Roman calmly went to the linen closet, which was, essentially, an armory. They pulled out gun after gun, and I took one too. If our enemies were coming for us now, all I could hope was that my angel was at home with her kids. Safe. An explosion sounded outside the front door, and the five of us lifted up our guns, aiming directly at the door. Banging from behind us made me turn to look over my shoulder. Armed men in black garb were dangling from ropes outside our balcony doors. They've come down from the roof. Roman stepped over to me, still facing the door. Stand back to back, brother. You cover us. They shouldn't get in through the glass or those doors, but you never know. Those doors aren't as secure as we'd like, Nate said, twisting around to stand back to back with Rafe while I did the same with Roman. The glass might be bulletproof, but those hinges aren't. He was right. The men fired at the glass windows, spraying bullets everywhere. The glass didn't yield and yet my heart pounded with every attack, readying my muscles for a fight I knew was coming. Roman suddenly started firing, and I realized the attackers had breached the front door. I didn't dare take my attention off the balcony to look behind me, but instead kept my gaze on the glass. Roman cried out, then fell heavily against me. I started automatically to turn, but he stopped me with his yell. Stay there. Guard the balcony. The men at the balcony entrance, covered head to toe in black combat gear, finally turned their attention to the hinges. Their strategy worked, and they broke through, the bulletproof glass doors dangling uselessly after the attack on the lock and hinges. I pulled the trigger on my machine gun and fired at the men coming through the opening. One went down, then another. The room was filled with groans of pain and the rapid clacking of the guns. We need one alive, Roman cried out. He was right. We'd never managed to keep one alive before, and this reign of terror needed to end. The only way to do that was to question one of these attackers. Nate. I called out to my brother without glancing over at him. Go low. I turned my gun to the remaining men's legs, taking out their knees. Three of them stumbled and fell. Nate killed the other two. I charged forward turning my gun around and using the shoulder piece to bash one in the side of the head, then the other. They fell to the ground, unconscious. Pain exploded in my shoulder just as Nate ran up and punched the third guy in the head. The guy fell, senseless, the gun he'd just used to shoot me with clattering to the ground. I fell to my knees, white stars covering my once clear vision. What the hell is that? Nate fell to the floor beside me. He shot you. I know, I tried to say, but my mouth wouldn't work. I'd known, I wouldn't be able to get all three before they got me. Ah well. My head felt fuzzy, but I didn't want to lie down and rest. If I did, I had the strangest feeling that I wouldn't be able to get up. I want to live to see my angel one more time. Nate yelled out. We need some help over here. I blinked and glanced around, trying to bring my vision into better focus. The two men I'd knocked out were moaning. Waking up. I managed to lift my hand and point to them. Don't let them get away. Gabe rushed over, blood covering his shirt. I gulped, forcing the lump of fear from my brother down my throat. Gabe? You hurt. My brother shook his head, not looking at me. It's not mine. It's Roman's. He immediately got to work, collecting the guns and other weapons from the bad guys. Bill joined him, and between them they handcuffed the two men and sorted through the pile of bodies for any other weapons or signs of life. Anthony came rushing toward us. I've called the private ambulance service you guys use. 
Are the girls safe? Is Rose okay? I suddenly had trouble standing up. My legs were way too wobbly. Nate ripped off his shirt and started wrapping it around my shoulder. I tried pushing him off but didn't have any strength. That hurts. Shut up, Nate whispered, though there was no heat in his tone. Yes, he called out to Anthony. The girls are safe. Bill limped over to me. We'll clean this mess up. You and Roman need to go with the medics. I blinked again, slow motion this time, and dropped forward onto the floor. I couldn't stop myself, and as I hit the tiles, I groaned against the extra pain. Turned out being shot hurt like a bitch. Let me through. Let me through. Angelique's voice screeched like a banshee, and I couldn't help but smile against the cold floor. My angel had come to take me to heaven. Pity, I didn't have the strength to get up and greet her. I heard Anthony say, let her through. Come, Angelique. He's over here. I turned my face toward the sound of their voices, but my eyes had slid closed. Angelique's warm hands pressed against my face. What happened? Oh my God, Gabe. You're hurt. Have you called the paramedics? And the police? Shush. I whispered to her, but I was pretty sure she wasn't talking to me. It's okay. She dropped down beside me, her knees pressing against my arm. It's not okay. Her voice was low and intense. This is bad. Really bad. She brought her mouth close to my ear and said, Don't you dare die on me. Okay? I haven't had time to get my head around all of this, but I can't lose you. Please. Her sob was what caught my heart and I forced my eyes open. The medics were here, and they were attending Roman. My brother wasn't moving and Chrissy was sobbing over him, her blonde hair sprawled like a blanket over his face. I forced my gaze up to my beloved. I won't die, I managed to get out. I just found you. Angelique pressed a kiss to my cheek and laughed. The sound was strained, but I appreciated her effort to be positive. My kids are dying to meet you. My two eldest girls told all the little ones about you. I tried to smile, but I wasn't sure if I succeeded or not. That's great. Seven kids. I still wasn't sure how to process that one. The medics came over to me and began injecting me with things, then wrapping my chest so tight I wanted to scream at the increased pain. Angelique fell back as they got me onto a gurney and began wheeling me from the room. I must have passed out because the next thing I knew, I was outside, in the cold air, the city lights flashing over me. Somehow, I heard Angelique's gasp over the ruckus, then she bent down to say in my ear, I just saw Rose's stepmother. She's here. And I don't think that's a coincidence. The men went to put me in the back of the ambulance, but I called out, Stop. One moment. Angelique once again bent her head close. You need to protect Rose, I told her. This could all be a distraction just to get to her. Who do I trust? Angelique asked, and I could have kissed the fates for giving me such a smart, sensible mate. Anthony and Bill. My brothers and the beloveds. No one else. The medic put his hand on my arm. We have to go. Angelique stepped away, and I was hoisted into the back of the van. They gave me another injection of something. A painkiller probably, because I couldn't fight the urge to close my eyes again. Moments later, I passed out. Chapter 7 Angelique The paramedics sped out of sight, and I raced back inside. I had to help Rose. The foyer was full of paparazzi snapping photos and flashes going off. The security was tight, not letting anyone else through. I ran to the elevator and the concierge buzzed me up to the penthouse I'd just come from. My heart was pounding and my palms were slick with sweat. I wiped them down my jeans, my arms shaking with stress. What was I going to do if those men came for Rosé? The doors opened and I walked back into a war scene. There were bodies everywhere. Blood on the floor. Guns piled high. Gabe had said this used to be a mafia gangster's apartment, and the space had lived up to its name. The three girls were talking to Anthony, and there were security guards milling around everywhere. I didn't know anyone else, but Gabe's words about who to trust were clear. I knew there were two enemies here. One that wanted the gargoyles dead, and one that wanted Rose dead. 
Thanks to the attack on the brothers, no one was thinking about Rose. I plastered a smile on my face and hopped over the pools of blood and around the strange men. I'd left my normal life at home, it seemed. I was in the twilight zone now. Angelique. Rose cried, throwing herself into my arms as I approached the group. Is Gabe okay? When she pulled back, her eyes were filled with tears. I was so afraid for him and Roman, but you too. If you had arrived when we were already locked in that room, oh my. Rose's hands went to her mouth. I grabbed her arm. Rose, we need to get you somewhere safe. She cocked her head. Why? She wiped the tears from her face and sniffed. These guys were after our men. I motioned to Anthony to come closer. We need to get Rose out of here. Gabe thinks this could be a diversion. Anthony turned his attention fully onto me. Are you sure? I don't think so. This attack took out two of the brothers. These guys were here for the gargoyles. I opened my mouth to say more but Anthony said, look, you're new. You don't understand the dynamics at work here. I'm going to help clean up this mess. We can talk later. A growl rose in my throat. I hated nothing worse than being spoken down to, like I was stupid. Or worse, ignorant. I grabbed Anthony's arm and pulled hard, hauling the security guard back from trying to head off. Listen to me, you dumb meathead. I thought you cared about Rose. He shook my hand off but didn't move away. I do, he snapped. She is the only reason I'm here. Rose stepped her close. Both of you, stop fighting. This is what they want. To tear us apart. No. I practically shouted, then took a couple of deep breaths in and out to control my annoyance. When I spoke again, I lowered my voice. I know that you all barely know me, but you have to listen to me. I. Bill walked up and gestured to Anthony, who turned away without a second thought. This time I did growl aloud, letting my frustration show. I turned to Rose. We need to get you out of here. Chrissy stepped close, her face streaked with tears and black mascara. We can't get out of here just now. I wanted to go with Roman in the ambulance or follow behind, but they won't let me out. That made things a little more difficult. I gestured to Bella and Chrissy, bringing the four of us together in a girl's circle. Is there another way out of here? The women all went still, then Chrissy said, There is, but I was told not to tell anyone. I grabbed Chrissy's hand and looked at them all in turn. Rose's stepmother is here. I saw her downstairs in the lobby. I told Gabe and he said I need to keep you safe, Rose. Rose whimpered beside me. Don't fall apart, I said gently. We need to think clearly and work together. This attack could be what it looks like and what Bill and Anthony obviously think. An attack on the men. But it could be an elaborate way of getting to you, Rose. So now that everyone is distracted, and two of the men are hurt, this is when they'll try to grab you. We have to get out of here. Just then one of the security guards walked over, his all-black outfit pristine and clean. He obviously hadn't been around earlier for the fight. Miss Rose, he said, as though that was her title. I've been told to get you moved to a safe location. But Nate... Rose looked over at her mate, who was deep in conversation with Bill and Anthony. It's all been approved, Miss Rose. The man reached for her arm and I slapped his hand away. He blinked at me, clearly surprised. Every red flag alarm bell I had was ringing. This was it. They were going to try and kidnap her. Or kill her in the elevator on the way down. I wasn't letting them get her. Not now. Not ever. I slid my arm into Rose's. Can we go together? I know Gabe wants me safe too. The man's mouth opened and closed a couple of times, as if he didn't know who I was. Or Gabe, for that matter. There was no way a man who'd been hired to look after us wouldn't know who Gabriel was. I didn't shout and cause a panic. The last thing I wanted to do was cause him to stress out and start shooting. It's just Rose at the moment, he finally said, his tone flat. But you're next. I gave him a winning smile. Okay. But just give us a few minutes, okay? 
The four of us were just saying, we need to go to the bathroom. We've been holding on because of the stress. All of you. He asked, frowning. I pulled Rose toward me and fluttered my hands at the other girls. Yeah, look at them. They've been crying nonstop. We're all a mess. Don't worry, there's no other way out of the apartment, so if you wait here, we'll come straight back. The man's shoulders relaxed a little. Okay. But don't take too long. Three minutes, I reassured him, then I turned and Chrissy led us out of the lounge area and along the hallway to Roman's room. Once in there, she moved over to a door that I assumed was a wardrobe, but when she put her palm against a hidden scanning pad that popped out of an undercover panel, I knew it wasn't. I rushed back to the bedroom door, closed it, then locked it as well. Not that a little latch would stop a well-trained man for long. But it might give us at least a few seconds more. Oh my god, Angelique. You were right. Rose squeaked. He's here for me. Yes. And since we know your stepmother wants you dead, we need to run. What about Anthony and Bill? Rose whispered. I glanced at Chrissy. You got your cell phone or something that we can contact Bill on? Chrissy darted over to the nightstand. This is Roman's phone. I nodded. Take that and everyone else dump your phones. I pulled out the drawer from the nightstand and threw my phone in there. Then they can't track us. The girls did as I said, though I could tell they were reluctant. Why don't I just stay? Bella said. Rafe and Nate will have a heart attack if they can't find us, Rose. She has to leave, I urged. We don't know who's working for Rose's stepmother, other than that guy out there. I'm sure he's not the only one. If they panic and open fire, they could kill us all, including the men who got through the first wave. There was a knock at the door then a male voice called out, Who's in there? I grabbed Rose's hand. We're going. Me too, said Chrissy, tying her long hair up in a quick ponytail. I'll stay, Bella repeated. And I'll let Nate and Anthony know what's going on. Where will you go? I shook my head. I won't tell you. But somewhere safe, okay? Tell Nate she'll be safe. I promise. On my life. Hey. Who's in there? The man called out again, this time trying to push his way through the door, the thing rattling on its hinges. Go. Bella urged, shooing us into the darkened tunnel and shutting the door behind us. I heard her call out. It's just me, Bella. I won't be long. I'm changing clothes. Chrissy grabbed two torches from a basket on the wall, turned them on and handed one to me. Let's go. This tunnel goes all the way down to the ground level, but it's a long walk and there are lots of stairs. I took a deep breath and nodded. Probably a good thing I didn't get many steps in today. Rose giggled but it was a worried, hollow sound. Come on, I said. Let's go. Chrissy was right, the tunnel was long and dark and cold. But with every step, I felt our freedom getting closer. About halfway down, or I hoped we were anyway, we stopped to take a breath. So where is this going to come out? I asked Chrissy. Please don't tell me we're gonna pop up in front of all those reporters. She shook her head. No. Roman told me the tunnel goes right under the street, and we'll end up in the basement of an apartment that the boys own as well. That was well planned, I said, still puffing from exertion. Obviously, I needed to get fitter, though if life with Gabe was going to be like this all the time, then I guessed I might get more exercise than I was used to. I laughed to myself, then gave a mental grimace. It was pretty poor humor, but it was all I could manage at this time. The tunnel and the additional apartment came with the main apartment, Chrissy explained. A package deal, I suppose. Not sure if the previous owner ever needed to use this escape route, though. We kept going down and down until we finally arrived at a locked door. Is this it? I asked, leaning against the wall to catch my breath. Yeah. I think so. Chrissy reached for the door handle. I haven't actually done this before. Roman only told me about it as a last resort. God, I hope he's okay. I'm sure he is, I said, my own heart aching for my injured man. And Gabe too. They're supernatural, paranormal people. 
I wasn't quite sure what the correct term was. Surely they have advanced healing? It was in every lore and legend of shifters and vampires. Yeah, they heal fast, Chrissy confirmed. But they can still die, and the brothers are stronger together. It's not good to have them separated. Chrissy pushed the door open fully, then reached inside and switched on the light. On the other side of the door was a furnished basement, with a pool table and couches for relaxing. It looked like an underground bar, but it was empty of people. Let's go upstairs and work out a plan, Chrissy said, waiting for us to come through, then locking the door behind us. I managed to get up the stairs and into the main apartment living area before my shaky legs finally went out from under me. I sank onto the nearest couch. Oh my god, what a night! Rose went to the front window and peeked out around the curtains. I wonder if she's still there. I bet she is, I said. She's waiting for her guys to bring you down. Or for them to carry my dead body out of the elevator, Rose growled. I ran my hands through my hair, my hands shaking now that we were finally safe. Or at least, safer. I longed for Gabe and imagined his strong arms wrapping around me. The thought made me feel marginally better. We need to contact someone we trust, Chrissy said, holding Roman's phone in her palms. Can I have that for a minute? I asked her, thrusting out my hand. I'm going to get some transport and sort out my kids. We'll hide at my place tonight, but tomorrow morning we really need to get out of the city. I have a country house a few hours drive away that would be safe. Chrissy handed the phone over without pausing, which said a lot for how much she trusted me. Thanks. I stood up and began dialing. Thank goodness I'd memorized my nanny's and Jenny's cell numbers, or I wouldn't be able to call anyone. Bloody smartphones had made us all dumb. Within ten minutes I had Jenny on side and the nanny packing the kids' clothes. Perhaps we should go tonight? Sharon said, sounding calm despite her nerves. I glanced at my watch, my mother's. I'd never taken it off. Despite everything that had happened this evening, it was only 7.30 page m. That's a good idea. Can you pack whatever food you can and get the kids on the road tonight? I'll call the groundskeeper and he'll get the country house warm and ready. You know the address, right? Don't say it over the phone, though. I do. Sharon said back. I exhaled slowly. Thank you, Sharon. You know those kids are everything to me. Sharon chuckled. I do. Now go do whatever you need to do, and I'll see you there when you get there. I hung up the phone and started making calls. We were all getting out of New York, and God knew when we'd be back. Chapter 8 Gabe The bullet was out of my shoulder, and the pain was bearable enough. I looked over at Bill who was standing next to my hospital bed. We need to leave. I have to go to my mate. Roman's still in surgery, Bill replied, his face drawn. I've got some of the team bringing your stones over to the hospital. We'll have to somehow figure out how to get you both onto them and hide you if you're still here at dawn. I won't be. I need to get to Angel. Um. Bill cleared his throat and I narrowed my eyes. What? We don't know where she is. My heart skipped a beat. Sorry what? What do you mean you don't know where she is? Bill sighed and ran a hand through his hair. Angelique came back to the apartment and warned us that we needed to move Rose. I shifted on the bed, wincing as I did so. Damn, it was hard to get comfortable. Being shot really sucked. Yeah, I told her to. We saw Rose's stepmother in the crowd outside. It was Bill's turn to wince. She told us that, but Anthony and I didn't really listen, and then next thing we knew, Bella was being bailed up by a private security guy, and the other three women were gone. I sat up, but pain shot through me like a lightning bolt. My breath caught in my throat. I swallowed down the groan. I had no choice. I would have to stay here a little longer and keep resting. I lay my head back on the pillow the monitor beside me beginning to beep thanks to my increased heart rate. What happened? I managed to grind out between my clenched teeth. Rafe ran to Bella's aid and we had the man arrested. 
He was looking for Rose and had two revolvers with silencer attachments. I closed my eyes against the wave of pain and frustration. So Angel was right. He was there to kill her. Yes. Bella stayed behind because of Rafe, but Chrissy got Rose and Angelique out, though the way Bella told it, Angelique was the one who got Rose away from the security guard when he grabbed her. It was your Angelique who saved all of the girls. I nodded, pride in my mate surging through me, though my eyes were still closed. She's a mother. She protects everyone naturally. Bill was quiet for so long I opened my eyes to make sure he was still there. Finally, he said, we needed one like her. The other three are all young. I nodded. He was right. So where do you think they all are? The door to my room burst open and Anthony came running in. Chrissy called me. Check your phone. Bill pulled his cell out of his pocket, then cursed loudly. What did she say? I asked, adrenaline surging through my veins. The monitor was going berserk. Someone from the hospital staff would likely be in to check on me in a moment. Anthony's face lit up as he spoke. Rose is okay. They all are. Thank God. Bill whispered, not quite under his breath. Angelique's family has a property outside of the city, about two hours' drive from here. They're going there and want us to join them as soon as you're able to be moved. I inhaled sharply, too much pain in my body to consider moving right now. I will heal a lot faster in my gargoyle form. So will Roman. Can you tell the girls we will meet them tomorrow night? Of course, Bill said, standing close to my bed. You need to get everything ready. The transport. The security. I'll do it all, Anthony said, then cleared his throat with a rough cough. I owe Angelique my life. She saved Rose when I didn't. That guy would have got to her and maybe even killed her before we could stop him. We were so distracted by what had happened to you guys. We thought the threat was over. And well, Angelique has my undying gratitude. I managed to smile, then everything went dark. The next time I opened my eyes, Bill was dragging me out of bed. You need to stand up, Gabe. Your stone is by the window. It's almost sunrise. We've paid for privacy and there's security everywhere outside this room, so you won't be disturbed. I swung my legs off the edge of the bed and got to my feet, then swayed forward with a lurch. Bill seemed ready for that and pressed into my side. He put my arm over his shoulders. My skin was tingling and the stone was still ten feet away. We had to hurry. I forced my legs to work, staggering forward. One step, two, three, four. Almost. Hurry. Bill's urgency spurred me to launch forward, and he bodily lifted me the last foot. I got both feet on the stone just as the sun hit my face. Bill ducked and twisted out of my grip and managed to not get hurt as my wings became stone and my feet turned to claws. When the transformation was complete, I could have yelled with happiness if my vocal cords weren't frozen. The pain was gone and I knew that during these hours of rest my body would heal so much faster than when in human form. Hopefully they'd gotten Roman out of surgery in time to stand him on his stone too. I didn't know how bad his injuries were, but I knew that standing him on his stone would be his best chance at survival. When darkness came again, I was so anxious to see Angelique that I was beginning to wonder if there was a way to break out of my gargoyle state before sunset. I'd never tried it before, but today I'd been tempted. Bill returned to stand beside me after being gone most of the day. As soon as I could speak once more, I turned to him. Do you sleep, Bill? His smile was as tired as his eyes. Not today, Gabe. I'll sleep when your family is safe. My chest tightened. Has something else happened? He shook his head. No. The doctors said they almost lost Roman last night, but the surgery went well. And then our team managed to get him to shift. We'll know shortly how well he is. I'm hoping the day in gargoyle form will help him heal as much it seems to have helped you. Bill Cell chirped. He lifted the phone and stared down at it. His sigh of relief was a palpable thing. He's okay. Anthony is with him and he's doing much better. I stepped off my stone and reached for the clothes Bill had laid out on the bed for me. I would have thought Anthony would be with Rose. Rose is safe. 
Bill said. As are Angelique and her children. The security team has been assembled around them. Only our best. I frowned at Bill, still worried. What about Anthony? He's concerned that Rose's stepmother tracked him down, and that's how she found Rose. Anthony is going to stay in the New York apartment and put all his efforts into finding out who wants you and your brothers dead. I finished dressing and clapped my hand on Bill's shoulder. Thank you, my friend. Let's go. Bill nodded and led me out of the private hospital suite, through the hospital and outside into a black jeep. Where's Roman? He's coming in another car. I nodded and glanced out the window. We were in full lockdown mode, it seemed. The drive was long, but every mile brought me closer to my mate. My heart sang at the thought of seeing my angel again. When we finally pulled up to a large stone fence and an iron gate, I slid to the edge of the seat and peered out the window. This is it. The gates opened to reveal a long, twisted driveway. Yes, Bill said, as taciturn as always. I reached for the bottle of water he'd placed for me in the cup holder, taking a sip to wet my dry lips. I needed a drink, and I needed a fresh steak, but what I most needed was to feel my mate's body against mine. To hear her voice and know that she was all right. The jeep pulled up next to a huge manor house, two stories high with twenty windows on each level. I gulped as I got out. Studying the windows. There was no way that glass was bulletproof. The front door opened as I jogged up the stairs, and Angelique came running out. My heart sang at seeing her, and I pushed my body to run just as fast, bending my knees so I could wrap my arms around her and scoop her up into a tight hug. She clung to me, wrapping her arms around my neck and not letting go. Oh my God! I can't believe how good this feels, she whispered next to my ear. I was so afraid I might never touch you like this again. I lowered my head and inhaled her scent, my lips stretched in a grin. Nothing was going to stop me finding you again. She chuckled and pulled back. Bloody sunshine. I don't know how I'm ever going to look at the daylight again without thinking of you trapped in that stone body. I inhaled sharply before nodding slowly. We still hadn't quite dealt with that whole topic yet, had we? So you believe me now? You know I'm not lying to you. She sighed. I never really thought you were lying. I just couldn't imagine what you were describing. And now? I asked, holding my breath as I waited for her answer. She shrugged. Whatever you are, I'll work out a way to be okay with it. Chrissy and Rose seem totally fine with everything. I smiled at her. Getting to know the girls, huh? She nodded. Yeah, they're great, actually. And my kids have loved having new people around. I gulped, my chest tightening with nervous tension. Your kids? They're all here. What if I meet them and they hate me? She laughed, slid her hand into mine and gently tugged me toward the front door. Of course. I couldn't leave them in New York with the threats hanging over us. Us. I repeated. I was pretty sure that Angelique would have been able to slip away, and no one would have ever known she was entwined with us. I wouldn't have survived the separation, of course, but I would have understood her need to protect her children, at least until our enemies were caught. Before she had a chance to answer the question, two little boys came running into the foyer. One had brown hair and dark skin, and the other had hair the color of carrots and a whole bunch of freckles across his nose. Mom! 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 Angelique gestured to the two boys. These are my two youngest. AJ and Toby. Boys, this is Gabriel. The red-headed boy tilted his chin to look up at me. You're tall. I couldn't help but smile. Ah, thank you. What do you two need? Angelique asked. Nanny Sharon said we can have ice cream for dessert, but only if you say yes. Angelique tapped her chin with a finger, as though she was thinking long and hard. You two have been so good today, I definitely think you've earned your dessert. The boys cheered and raced away again. Angelique turned to me with her eyebrows raised. Ready to head for the hills yet? I frowned at her. Excuse me? Her grin was a little lopsided as she stared at me, and I noticed dark smudges beneath her eyes. She looked like she hadn't slept in days. 
Was that because of me? Most guys would run away the moment I mentioned the kids, let alone met a few. I tried not to laugh. It was probably a true statement as far as most other guys. But it didn't apply to me. I reached out and took both of her hands. You are severely underestimating the power of our bond, Angel. But once I take you to bed this evening, you'll understand. Her pupils dilated and her lips separated on a gasp, inviting me in. I dropped my head to kiss her, stealing her breath while she stole my heart. Mom. We were just, oh oh. Angelique pulled away and let go of my hands as well. Yes, sweetheart? I turned toward the teenager I'd met the other night at Angelique's home in New York. Good evening, Jenny. Hey. The girl grinned back at me. We're, um, gonna take the young ones up for bath and bed and stuff. Angelique glanced at me and asked, wanna meet the whole family? I reached for her hand once more, not willing to be apart from her. Yes, I was nervous, but I would never run. Not when it came to Angel. And her children. Lead the way. Chapter 9 Angelique The kids all took to Gabe like little monkeys to a tree. They fawned all over him, giggling and laughing, trying to feed him ice cream while he tried to explain he couldn't eat it. When they were all finally bathed, dressed in pajamas and in bed, my stomach was sore from laughing so hard. Good night, girls, I called out to Piper and Lottie, my 10 and 11 year olds. Night, Mom. This house was huge, but with Rose and Chrissy here, a bunch of security guys, and now the men staying with us too, all the kids had to double up and share rooms. I closed the twins' door and turned toward my room. Gabriel was standing in the doorway, leaning against the frame with his shoulder. Bedtime? My breath caught in my throat, and my pulse fluttered in my chest at the seductive look in his eyes. Yes? Everyone else was tucked away in their bedrooms, and each of the gargoyles' shifting circles was set up for sunrise in their respective safe spaces. Gabriel's had been set up in my room while we were getting the kids ready for bed. I walked along the carpeted hallway, the walls lined with paintings and old photos my mother had framed. Your house is beautiful, Gabriel whispered as I stepped closer. But not as beautiful as your kids. I laughed, surprised by the comment. I'd assumed that he was about to give me the compliment, but what he'd said truly warmed my heart. Thank you, I totally agree with you of course. Gabriel drew me closer. Shut the door. I need you. I pushed out my arm, shoving the door shut with my hand. There were so many questions going through my mind. About the kids, and how long we were going to stay here. About the men hunting the gargoyles, and those after Rose. But I pushed the questions aside. Between my inheritance and the gargoyle brothers' money, it was obvious that unlimited security and private tutors were not out of the question. Gabe's hands feathered down my arms and wrapped around my waist. I slid my arms around his neck and pulled him close, kissing him deep, tangling our tongues until I knew his taste. He lifted me up and carried me to the bed. I couldn't wait to be closer. He was going way too slowly for me now. I tore at his clothes, needing to feel his skin against mine. He leaned back to help me, pulling his shirt up over his head, then unbuttoning his trousers and dropping them to the floor. I couldn't help the way my face heated with a blush as I stared at him. His body was fucking magnificent. All hard angles, big muscles and smooth skin. But I didn't get to stare at him very long before he grabbed the hem of my sweater to drag it up. I raised my arms so my top came off quickly, then my leggings and shoes. When I was down to my underwear, I paused, unsure that I wanted him to see all of me. This bra did a great job making my boobs look good, and my tummy was hidden with these knickers. How about we turn the lights down? I suggested, already moving toward the light switch for the main overhead light. I then flicked on the lamps beside the bed, softening the starkness. The light in the room was dim now, which was disappointing because I couldn't see him super well, but at least I would look better in the darkness too. Gabe stepped closer. You know I have better vision in the dark. I groaned. Damn. Really? He chuckled. You are exquisite to me, you know that? Perfect. 
Fate designed your body, your heart, your mind, to suit me, and I you. I couldn't imagine a more beautiful woman than you. I wanted to rebuff his beautiful words, my own insecurities rising up to eat at my happiness. But I swallowed them down and stepped forward, pressing both palms to his chest the flesh was heated beneath my hands. You're the one who's beautiful, Gabe. I can't believe how much I want you. It took forever for my heart to begin to slow, and for the gasps of pleasure still hanging in the air to settle. Gabe rolled to the side and gathered me in his arms. I pulled the blankets up and over us, still shivering with aftershocks from the most powerful orgasm I'd ever known. That was amazing, I whispered into his chest, kissing the sweat from his skin. Is it always going to be like that? Gabe chuckled and tucked the blankets around my back. I don't know. My brothers said that mating with their beloveds was the single most incredible moment of their lives. I haven't asked about how it's been since. I smiled as I closed my eyes. Yeah. I can imagine that wouldn't come up in general conversation. A blissful lethargy was stealing over my limbs, but I needed to know one more thing. Do you think we're going to be safe here? At this property? Gabe squeezed me tight. We'll have a big family meeting in the morning. Anthony is in New York, and he's on the warpath to protect Rose. He told me to thank you for saving her. And he said he apologized for not listening to you the way he should have. I shrugged, not wanting to talk. It was my pleasure. He kissed my hair. I'm so proud of you. I love you, I managed to say, then slid into sleep. There were still bad guys chasing my family, and in the morning we would deal with the next steps to fight them. But for this moment, I was going to enjoy the wonder of finally finding my one true love. Reality could wait for tomorrow. The end. There is going to be one more book in the Gargoyle Shifters of New York City. The final book that's going to tie everything together. Thank you so much for your support and your reading of this book, and I hope you'll join me in reading the next one. Until I can get it written, please download another of my free books. I recommend The Shifter's Stolen Fi for steamy paranormal goodness. You can download the book, here.